this is about measurement at the atomic level in quasi crystals using the quasi Bragg law and a special metric. Crystallographers commonly ask of quasi crystals where are the atoms? In this micrograph, every atom is specified, located, and measured for size. The micrograph is modeled on the right and mirror image where the each uh, triad of golden rectangles represents a cluster. On a micrograph, a cluster can be identified by 10 subclusters arranged on a circle around a tripartite center. Five clusters represent a section of a supercluster in this hierarchic model. Here is the cluster. It is icosahedral and it's made up of 12 icosahedral subclusters. The subclusters are edge sharing, not face sharing. And as you can see, they are aligned. Here is a subcluster. As you can see, it has 12 corners. The corners connect 20 triangular congruent faces, and the faces are themselves joined by 30 edges. Here is another representation of the same subcluster. It contains a small central atom and 12 larger atoms. The, cent the small atom is at the center. And here is another representation of the same subcluster. It contains 20 faces, as you can see. And this subcluster is very dense as we're going to show in a moment. And it's the driving force for this icosahedral structure. So how do we measure that density? By diffraction using the quasi bragg law. The diffraction pattern is sharp. Here we compare two units in a crystalline solid on the left and a, a quasi-crystal on the right. Aluminium 6 manganese is two-phase and the crystalline phase is on the left and the icosahedral phase is on the right. In the crystalline phase the small solute atom manganese rattles inside a raft of aluminum atoms in the face-centered cubic structure. In the icosahedral phase Three atoms move up on the raft and three atoms move down and the structure compresses about that solute atom, taking away the rattle space and reducing the volume. There's a density increase of 17%. And this is the driving force. Return now to that icosahedral cluster. A golden triad can represent a subcluster or a cluster as we saw in the micrograph or by extension a supercluster orders one, two, three to infinity. Here we have a structure that is infinitely extensive, that is uniquely aligned and that is uniquely icosahedral and we call this the logarithmically periodic solid. The supercluster model has a sharp diffraction pattern, so it has a quasi lattice A subscript I plus B subscript I times tau. I are the three spatial dimensions, not six. A and B are positive or negative integers. The golden section tau is equal to one plus root five all over two. It has a value of 1.618. The stretching factor between orders is tau squared. The symmetry of the diffraction pattern follows the symmetry of the foil and it's usually described as following the Fibonacci sequence. In the Fibonacci sequence, each term is the sum of the two preceding terms. When the ratio of those two terms is tau, the Fibonacci sequence forms a geometric series which extends to infinity and is also infinitesimal. Notice a few features about this series. First of all, the geometric series is uh, uh, divided into two Fibonacci sequences. Secondly, 
tor is equal to 1 plus 1 over tor. And by substitution uh, in the second Fibonacci sequence, we get three Fibonacci sequences that we're going to look at in a moment. Finally, notice that the integer on the second sequence is near to tor times the value of the integer on the first sequence. And uh, as the order increases, it, be, it, it, it tends closer and closer to tor times the value of the uh, first sequence. So the diffraction pattern and the supercluster model are both logarithmic, and these indices are orders. So let's look again at the uh, long range. In the long range, a geometric term, G subscript M, splits, as we just showed, into three Fibonacci terms, F subscript M plus F subscript 0 plus F subscript 0 over tor. That's making the substitution of a tor is equal to 1 plus 1 over tor. And as M increases, F0 tends to F subscript M times uh, tor. By substitution, we get here three terms, two are integers, and one tends to an integer. So all terms are either integral or tend to integral values. In the long range, the series is approximately integral. This fact is significant for coherence in the diffraction of an incident sinusoidal wave, as we proved by simulation. In short range, the series is approximately half integral. Let's look at, have a look at those values. Here are the geometric series with increasing order going downwards. And here are the long range values. Look at them. They are all almost integral for reasons that we've just shown. But look at the short range values. They are all almost half integral. 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2 2.5, 4. And the differences from half integral values are uh, listed on the, uh, on the right, uh, where uh, we've calculated the modulus of the geometric term G subscript N modulo 0 0.5, and it's about 5%. We're going to see that value come up again in the simulations. Finally, while we're on this slide, notice one other point, that the orders appear in terms in various superclusters. They appear in pairs in various superclusters. Supercluster order 4, order 3, order 2, order 1, and so on. And so with these features, we're able to construct the quasi Bragg law. Here is the Bragg law. n lambda equals 2d sine theta. n is the order, lambda is the wavelength, d is the interplanar spacing, theta is the Bragg angle. Well, in the quasi Bragg angle, the order n is logarithmic, becomes tor to the minus m. And secondly, because of those half integral values at short range, the quasi uh, 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 Bragg law is in second order Bragg, so the factor 2 cancels. And thirdly, because of those moduli, there's a metric, special metric for the interplanar spacing, d prime is equal to d over cs. And we're going to see that in the simulation uh, as well. And finally, the quasi Bragg angle, theta primed, is different from the Bragg angle. With this law, all cell dimensions are measured. These features were discovered in the diffraction simulations of the hierarchic model. Notice before we go on that calculated diffraction beam intensities match experimental values very well indeed. Here is an example, a typical example, of a diffracted beam calculated as the scattering from 100 million atoms in a supercluster order 6. And the quasi Bragg angle differs from the Bragg angle that appears in uh, crystals in uh, uh, classical crystallography. It differs by about 5% because of those moduli that we uh, calculated before. So how does the diffraction occur? The fact that diffraction does occur, that it's indexed in three dimensions and simulated, says something about hyperspace. Well, where is hyperspace? It's in its own idiosyncratic hyperspace all alone. It's not needed, but what is important is that the subclusters align, and they align by three mechanisms, which we're going to show next. Here are two 
quads. One is a concave quad and one is a planar quad. Let's look at those in a little more detail. First of all, three subclusters are joined at a triple point at the center. A triple point is where three subclusters join. Suppose we want to make a quad. We can do this in two ways. We can take that subcluster we saw before, and there are only two ways we can make a second triple point. One is as a concave quad on the top, and the other is as a planar quad on the bottom. So these are two quads which are made from edge sharing subclusters, four of them. And the concave quad is the most interesting at the moment because it's the building block for the hierarchic structure. The planar quad occurs in glassy defects. So those are two methods by which alignment occurs in uh, quasi-crystals. We'll go on to discuss another method which is overlaps. Here is the subcluster again that we saw and we're going to remove the top subcluster. And now we're going to attach by overlap a subcluster in its place. And what you can see here is two uh, clusters that are aligned and this Overlap can be extended indefinitely in the vertical direction, making a structure which is the same as a decagonal structure in decagonal quasi-crystals. So that's the third mechanism by which alignment occurs. We've calculated many other features of this hierarchic model. Here is one. It's an electronic free electron nearly free electron band structure. It's plotted on logarithmic scales and the band structure can be used to uh, explain the uh, negative temperature coefficients in electrical conductivity of these materials. And here's another thing that we've discussed uh, that uh, we've discussed which is the uh, uh, tiling of quasi-crystals. Because the Clusters, subclusters, share edges, not faces. The two dimensional tile consists of closed dodecahedral surfaces. The edges of this closed decahedral are the uh, uh, joining edges for subclusters. The figure uh, 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 on the top left shows how uh, icosahedral clusters. Uh, uh, tile, uh, the three-dimensional icosahedral stru structures, tile a two-dimensional dodecahedron. On the right, the same for a supercluster. And below it, a supercluster order two. And the same supercluster order two with one icosahedral uh, subcluster at the end. Further details for the quasi Bragg law can be found in www dot quasicrystal dot us and with our video introduction here on YouTube and uh, background information on in this book logarithmically periodic solids. Here are the atoms.